personal freedom, political liberty, and free speech. Defended by force of arms, if necessary, welcome to the Resistance Library from Ammo.com, where we believe that arming our fellow Americans, both physically and philosophically, helps them fulfill our Founding Fathers' intent with the Second Amendment to serve as a check on state power. Hello, Resistance Library listeners. It's Molly and Sam from Ammo.com. And today we're going to discuss one of the firearm industry's greats, uh, Benjamin Tyler Henry. Uh, Henry isn't necessarily as famous to the general public as some of the other gun gurus like Sam Colt or Daniel Wesson, but that doesn't negate Henry's influence in the arms industry or the transformation his in- innovations created. So let's jump right into things, Sam. Uh, before we get into Henry's history, I want to take a moment and talk about the Henry rifle and what made it so cutting edge. So can you tell me a little about that? Sure. So people had been, uh, you know, kind of trying to figure out a way to get guns to fire faster for a while. This was a, some. This was an idea that was just kind of floating around in the ether um, for a while. We talked about it on the Luger podcast as well. Um, and, you know, Henry is probably more than anyone else, um, the father of, you know, it's not a semi-automatic, but it fires a lot faster than, uh, anything else. So he's, he's the, the big breakthrough in the world of, uh, ammunition is the, the Henry rifle. Um, this was the thing that they had been, you know, other people have been working on, and this was the thing that they were trying to get. Um, moving was something that, you know, you didn't have to spend quite so much time um, loading. And when he worked on it, he was working with, you know, it was the first Smith and Wesson company. It's not the Smith and Wesson that we know today. It's a different company, but it's the same two guys. Uh, They later renamed this the volcanic repeating arms company, which I think is one of the coolest names of a company ever. Um, And, you know, that was started in 1855. Oliver Winchester was an investor. So there was a lot of people whose names are synonymous with firearms um, working for this company, but it didn't last very long. Uh, eight months later, the uh, Winchester kind of forced the company into insolvency and um, he took the company over, moved it to New Haven. It became the New Haven Arms Company, um, which later became the Winchester Repeating Arms Company. Um, the, he hired Henry as the plant supervisor, uh, because he, you know, was, everybody trusted Henry. Um, and Henry's actually like, Henry's a really interesting figure because he, you know, he's from New Hampshire, which I'm sure a lot of our listeners are, are, are either born in New Hampshire or moved there. Um, they were one of the most prominent families in the area. His grandfather, um, invented, in, invented the, the, the rye fly water wheel, which I don't know exactly what that is, but it's some kind of water wheel that made, um, you know, the paper industry, uh, b- blow up in that town. And then his cousin kind of perfected it. And, you know, so Claremont, New Hampshire was a big town for paper production. Um, so he's very much, you know, rooted in this 19th century industrial revolution, of I- innovation and, um, you know, t- tinkering with things to try and make them better, um, engineering from the perspective of we have, there's stuff that we already have. How do we kind of, you know, turn it up and make it a little, make it a little better. And, 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 you know, these kind of little minor tweaks are actually, uh, in many ways, far more revolutionary than, than many of the things that were, that we would today consider to be, uh, disruptive or innovative, but Henry was working as a gunsmith from a very young age, and so he knew his way around weapons. And this is actually really where his passion was at. He was a big fan of messing around with guns. You know, he just liked to tinker around with guns and make them better and do what he could to to perfect them. Um, he and this is kind of how he gets into, you know, innovating the the Henry rifle, um, as we know today, uh, which, you know, it could easily have been called something else, but it's, it's the Henry rifle. 
Right. And uh, in case our listeners aren't real sure, can you, ex- so we, we call it, we say that it's uh, repeating arms. Uh, is it like a lever action? The, the Henry the Henry rifle is that what we would call it today yeah it's a le- it's a lever action rifle I mean you like you know you don't need to know anything about guns to have seen this thing before we talk about iconic profiles of weapons um, you know the Henry rifle is like John Wayne on a horse you know mowing down bandits and Indians kind of thing like um, if you've watched Deadwood it's like you know everyone in deadwood has a repeating as a as a henry rifle um it's it's very that kind of lever action is like you know synonymous with the american west in this kind of same way that like a six shot uh wheel gun would be um but yeah henry is the one who in who invented it and he spent a lot of time working on it he got the patent in october of 1860 um and it wasn't that it was it the, the Henry rifle wasn't you know everywhere in every hand on every battlefield during the Civil War, but in the places where it was deployed, people quickly got it. Like this thing is this thing is an absolute game changer because you were getting off twelve shots in what normal in the time it would normally take you to get off one, which isn't which doesn't sound like that much to us today, but at the time, you know, it's, you were, you you could have one, you could effectively have one guy against 12 soldiers because they would shoot. And, you know, the weapons at the time weren't all that accurate anyway. Um, Particularly the ones that the Confederacy were using, because a lot of times they were like going into battle with grandpa's, revolutionary war musket or something um so this was not you know the 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 potential and the possibilities of this were not um missed now if if you were a really really skilled rifleman um in the days before the henry repeating rifle you could get a few rounds off in a minute you know like a handful of rounds off in a full minute yeah, I tell you what, I have a couple muzzle loaders. I can't shoot. I can't load one of them in a minute. <laughs> I'm right. not real proficient, but yeah, it takes me some time. <laughs> right. I mean, there's a reason why why muzzle loaders are such a niche thing. Like, right. They're fun to a certain type of person, but if you ha- like, you wouldn't want to have to rely on it, you know. Um, and in the same minute, the Henry repeating rifle could get off like 16 shots without being reloaded. And let's face it, they're, they're way easier to reload. So they reload themselves quick. So yeah, like you said, a, a dozen bullets might not seem like a lot, but when when you're spending that whole time getting fired at and not able to fire back, it, it sure makes a difference. Right, right. And and so the Henry, like, you know, most kind of groundbreaking technologies, um, the Henry rifle wasn't cheap. Um, I don't know the exact price of it, but that was one of the things about it was that it was expensive. I mean, anybody who kind of knows about you know, the cost of the cost of like one ballpoint pen versus the cost of a million ballpoint pens, that kind of concept. Um, yeah, the early Henry's were not cheap uh, because they were new and there was a lot of um, engineering time that had gone into making them. And, you know, there was like one factory in the entire world making them. Um, but the the thing was that the dollar that you had to spend you know the do- if you were buying your own weapon which many of these guys did um if you were <clears throat> or the military either way it didn't matter it was the it was the speed of fire that made these things such a value um you know and 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 i think that one of the kind of you know key phrases when we talk about the muzzle loader is a skilled rifleman could get off a few <laughs> you know and in the age of modern warfare, which in many ways the, the American Civil War is the first kind of modern war, um, you know, y- 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 the ratio of skilled riflemen to unskilled um, is is not great. So you need something much more like the Henry that's about regular guys who've maybe handled the gun a few times to be able to get off a ton of shots in a short period of time, as opposed to one guy with a ton of accuracy 
who's you know like it's just it's a bang it's a bang for buck thing um and so the it's not an exaggeration to say that the henry rifle has completely changed the course of human history right. it's that level <laughs> of um it's almost like a gutenberg press level of invention in terms of how um disruptive it is you know to the to the broader world around it um there's not like there's not a lot of chance the the confederacy didn't have much of a chance going up against guys with this weapon um and a lot of other reasons but i mean the the henry rifle like certainly tipped the scales dramatically in favor of the union not because it was so widespread but because they just went oh okay like we get it we need this thing that shoots really fast I imagine it's almost the uh, same difference that the automatic weapons had when they came, right? A, a couple uh, decades later, um, it changed the game. It, it changed the playing field. Um, you had to up the game to compete, uh, because yeah, because it, you're, you're simply outgunned. You're outgunned, um, even if you have more manpower. Right. That's it. I mean, that's it, it is that level of uh, change in terms of you know the firepower and. Um, it, it know, was primarily the, the North that had them with the, with the being I'm a new sh- Haven. I'm I sure imagine. that there were some, I'm sure some of them were trickling their way down to the Confederacy, but yeah, they're being made in new Haven and, um, you know, the blockade was kept pretty tight, especially after, um, you know, especially after the, the, the first couple of years of the war, um, you know, the, the, I think that m- the primary source of them for the Confederacy probably would have been capturing them off of dead Union soldiers. Though, don't quote me on that. That's just an intuition, not not a a fact. But yeah, I mean, there was like you know, there was one factory making them, and it was in New Haven, and um, so there certainly were going to be a lot more of them in the North than there were in the in the South. Um, they only made fifteen thousand of these things. You know, that's how many were made. So to kind of give you a perspective on on what I'm talking about, about how it's not just like every every uh, Yankee soldier is running around with a Henry repeating rifle. Um, you know, that's certainly not the case. There was 15,000 of them made. Um, f- but, you know, there's a, there's a kind of semi-famous story um, about the Battle of Altoona Pass that I'm sure was leveraged to great effect by Henry and company in terms of selling these things. Um, They were, you know, the union side was uh, thought they were outgunned, but uh, in the words of major William Ludlow, what saved us that day was the fact that we had a number of Henry rifles. There were 16, uh, you know, a company of 16 shooters hit the parapet at this battle and the Henry rifle just kept dr- dropping them. Um, so there was, and once this, once this uh, company hit the parapet and all got dropped, no one else tried to take the fort because it was just so it was, it was a lot of it was just the psychological effect of, Oh, 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 oh my God, I can't believe how fast these guys can fire at us. You know, it was like, it, it was almost like, if you go to battle and like there's a thunderclap and half the field drops dead, you know, you wouldn't be uh, running across the field quite as quickly as the first group of people did. Uh, The psychological effect of it, I think can't really be overstated because we hear, you know, 16 rounds in a minute and it's like, yeah, you know, whatever. But uh, that was a lot for a time period when you could maybe get off four or five, if you were really good in the span of a, in the span of a minute. And so this is kind of what, um, you know, where you see the, um, change in the culture is both on the military and in the civilian side, you know, they were, um, they were used, the, the Henry repeating rifle was used extensively in the Indian wars after the civil war. So that's another place where this one invention makes a huge difference. Uh, change in human history and it was also very very popular among civilians um you know anywhere that you were in the borderland during the civil war um 
Kentucky, Southern Illinois, Missouri, Southern Indiana. Um, a lot of these places were still kind of on the frontier. Um, you know, they were not as, shall we say, civilized as other places in the union, um, you know, like say Georgia or New York or something. And so, you know, if you wanted something to kind of protect yourself against native American tribes, and you were worried about marauding bands of soldiers coming through your town, um, this was a good weapon to have because you might be able to hold off, you, know, you might be able to hold off a company of 16 with this one, rifle and even if that wasn't the case it was certainly the image that the weapon quickly came to have yeah i imagine right because it's like an all-purpose weapon it, it, people are going to use it for self-defense they're going to use it against dangerous wildlife uh, on the frontier they're going to use it to shoot dinner um uh, all around um right so uh, this was interesting i um i do not have uh a winchester or uh original Henry rifle, but I have some Henry rifles, right? So I thought there was a connection between the Henry repeating arms company that we have today that makes lever action rifles. But uh, yeah, I've, I found out that wasn't the case. No, there's no, there's no connection whatsoever. Yeah. It's just, it's just the name. Um, the original rifles, like I said, they only made 15,000. Um, and they're very, they're very sought after today because they're just beautiful pieces of, weaponry I mean, they're just nice to look at the uh brass patinates very beautifully um but no the current henry i believe it's called the henry repeating arms company am i yeah yeah um yeah has absolutely nothing to do with it it's just kind of an aesthetic uh choice on on their part i you know i know nothing about whether or not um they the, what their weapons are really kind of like i mean i think it's cool that they that they try and keep his memory alive. Their company slogan is made in America or not made at all, which I think is, is, is very cool. But yeah, yeah I mean, I, I no, Henry didn't really leave behind any legacy within the world of firearms design or firearms manufacturing other than this weapon, because he wasn't happy with the new deal that he had with Winchester. Um, he didn't think that he was getting paid enough he petitioned the Connecticut state legislature for ownership of the company. Uh, it, it wasn't that it was denied. It was that um, he was kind of outmaneuvered by Winchester. Uh, Winchester went to Europe and reincorporated the new ha new Haven arms as the Winchester repeating arms company, which is you know the name that it was known by for decades after that. Um, he modified the original design of the Henry repeating rifle and the child of that was, was the Winchester uh, 1866, which is an, uh, another kind of, you know, iconic Western um, old West wild West um, taming the frontier kind of weapon. One of the things that people talk about when they talk about why uh, Henry split from Winchester is they often talk about the money and money was certainly at issue because Henry did not feel that he was being fairly compensated for this revolutionary design. That was basically all his idea. Um, but he also didn't really like the work. He didn't like being a plant foreman. He didn't like being in charge of this kind of industrial, uh, mode of production, which was, which is honestly the thing I think is coolest about him is that he just didn't like the factory. Uh, he didn't like the factory mode of production. He was always looking for ways to tinker with and perfect and improve weapons and that, and do that in the way that, you know, this is something that only a gunsmith does. This is not something that a factory floor guy does, or even like if you're chief engineer, you know, it's just not the same kind of hands on, um, small scale production that he really seemed to like. And so he, after in 1864, the split begins and, uh, you know, he works as a solo gunsmith until the day he dies in 1898. And he, and, and from everything we know about it, he loved working solo with his hands on these 
on these kind of smaller scale projects that allowed him to really get into the minutia of what it is that made a great weapon. And I think that without that, without that kind of tinkering spirit, I don't know that, that uh, we would have gotten the Henry repeating rifle. You know, it's not to say that somebody else wouldn't have come up with something similar. I think that this kind of, um, thing was in the e was in the aether and people were thinking you know how can we get weapons to fire faster and um and you know somebody kind of would arrived at there because i think fundamentally it's an engineering problem and engineering problems have answers and it's just about kind of putting the time and energy and the money into figuring out how we make this thing happen um and henry was just the guy who got there first which isn't to discount him because i do think that he really was a genius in the true sense of the word you know like a genius is really somebody who can like see something that no one else can see and can see the potential that no one else can see and can see the path between where we are now and the thing that the thing that they're trying to make happen and henry really was that kind of uh person but it was that same kind of it was the same um, kind of genius that had him seeing this as, as an engineering problem uh, in, in a in a like if I just fiddle with this weapon enough I can figure out how to make it you know do the thing that I want it to do that made him like being a gunsmith but hate being a factory foreman um, so. He never really was a fame seeker. I mean, you would think that he would be. You'd think that, you know, especially because his name is on the weapon, that he would kind of be, you know, out there trying to get uh, the fortune and glory out of making firearms. But if that was what he wanted to do, he could have just started up another weapons factory. And certainly the market would have been his for the taking because it was it was such an it was such an iconic weapon, especially after after that battle that i talked about you know who wouldn't have wanted to own a henry rifle um so he you know he he but he just goes back to being a gunsmith and i really think that you know there's a tendency to kind of when somebody says oh it's about the money um you know to to, to say to kind of view that as as a as a opportunistic or even greedy sort of thing. But I think that in the case of Henry, he just really felt that he was dealt with unfairly by Winchester. And there's kind of maybe some uh, truth to that. You know, I mean, if you look at kind of the history of Winchester and the Winchester repeating arms company, you know, he comes into this company as an investor and then there's a split because he's trying, you know, Oliver Winchester is always doing these machinations to get more control over the financial control over the company. Um, and then he's obviously very good at politicking Henry out of ownership of the company. So I think that, you know, I think that, that there's probably something to be said about the fact that Henry was not being fairly compensated. I mean, that was certainly what he thought and nothing that he does later in his life seems to indicate that he's really concerned with, you know, being the richest man in town or having the biggest house in town. Because again, like he, he doesn't open another factory. He just goes and becomes a gunsmith. Well, Sam, um, I don't have any more questions about Henry myself. Do you have anything else that you'd like to share with our listeners? Well, that's the thing is like, we don't actually know, tons about the life of henry other than i mean the, it's again it's another thing that i think is interesting about him is that his work kind of seems to speak for itself um and i think that that's very from what i know about him very in keeping with his personality and his persona is that you know he um yeah i mean he just like he's known for his work um which i think is again very both very cool and very in keeping with what his uh, ethos was as a as a gun designer and uh, you know working in the world of, of weapons manufacturing uh, you know he didn't as I said go ahead and start another factory and put his name on it and put himself out there um, he just kind of went back to quiet quietly working on his guns um, and I think that you know it's totally like from a couple perspectives it's really it's really easy to understand why people want to own these things uh, which you know obviously are not the most powerful, efficient 
you know, weapon in the world today. Uh, but, and it's not just that it's this groundbreaking thing. It's that it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful piece of, of design, a beautiful piece of engineering. I mean, it's almost like owning a 1903 Harley Davidson, you know, you're not going to win any um, motorcycle races with it, but you're going to have this beautiful piece of American history, particularly if you take care of it and restore it and that kind of thing. Um, and I think also for people that are into wildcatting, he's kind of a, um, you know, a curious figure and, and an inspirational figure because he saw a need in the world of firearms and went about, um, you know, filling that need. Um, so I just think he's, he's, you know, despite the fact that there's not a ton known about his life, um, I think that he's a really cool figure. So that's it for today, folks. Head on over to ammo.com where we strive to arm you physically and philosophically and check out our resistance library where you can see Sam's new article on Benjamin Tyler Henry. Um, I will be sure to throw in a link into the podcast description for you. Uh, so you don't have to go hunting for it. And if you're in the market for some ammunition, be sure to check out ammo.com backslash podcast, where we have a discount code just for our listeners. Um, So thanks for checking in. And until next time, stay strong, stay free. Mm